Hey, welcome Thank to this you. conversation with the N- um, New York African Film Festival. Um, Thank you. Ju- just give a quick, brief intro. Um, this uh, we're having this conversation um, on the on the back, um, or I should say, in honor um, of the screening of your of your father's films, Kadar, um, a film which. Uh, which is actually a pretty big deal because this is a film I know has not been publicly viewed in decades. Um, and I'll give you a little bit more on that. But, um, but anyway, my name is Shaka Shomulu, um, for those watching. And uh, I'm going to be interviewing Kulia Fonayo, the son of the director of the film Kadara, um, who, um, Adeyemi Afolayo, popularly, who was popularly known as Ade Love, and uh, who was a pioneer or should, who should, who, uh, well, he was a pioneer and a member of what I like to call the pioneer generation of Nigerian filmmakers, people who are um, active in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and, uh, they, and they made a lot of amazing works, a lot of works that have been lost over the years, yeah. which is one of the reasons why this is such a big deal. To have to get the opportunity to watch this film, um, and I'm speaking with uh, Kunle, who is an accomplished filmmaker in his own right. He's made such films as *The Figurine*, *October One*, *Phone Swap*, and the recently released uh, *Citation* on Netflix. Um, and uh, we're, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm looking forward to having a really, really rich conversation with him today. Uh, so, Kunle, once again, welcome. Yeah, thank um, you, Shaka. Uh, let's just well, we'll just get right into it. Um, just okay, just to give a bit of background um, to those who don't know, um, your father started out in theatre, um, the Yoruba Traveling Theatre, yeah. and like a lot of the luminaries of that um, of that um, theatre movement, people like Hubert Ogunde, uh, people like Baba Sala. Um, they migrated, if I can use that word, into the cinema. When, once, the, once cinema became a viable option in the 1970s, a lot of them moved from the live theater. Well, I mean, I guess they continued to do live theater, but they added the cinema mm. as another way of, another form of artistic creative expression. And um, Absolutely. yeah, so um, I, I believe Kadara was your father's, I mean, he had made, he had starred in a couple of films before the mm. uh, directed by yeah. Ija Ominura and uh, Ajani Ogun. Ajani um, Ogun, yeah. Yeah, in the, in the late 70s. But then I believe Kadara was, he, this was his, the first one he directed personally. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so let me just kick it off by asking you, um, what, for me watching this film, I just noticed a lot of, it's very different, obviously, from the films of, um, of today, what we call Nolly, you know, Nollywood. But at the same time, there are also a lot of similarities. I noticed a lot of similarities in terms of um, some of the themes, um, some of the, the genre elements. You know, you've got, you've got your romance, you've got your, um, your intrigue. Um, you know, I mean, Kadara is kind of set in a pre-modern time, you know, so you've got, you know, um, a village setting, but also a kind of a royal setting. So you've got all that palace mm. tree. And, those, and we still see those kind of um, narrative troops in a lot of films today. Um, there's a lot of magic and super, supernatural elements, which is definitely something we still see in a lot of films. Mm. So, so, you know, in a way, it, very different, but also very similar. So I guess what I want to ask is um, how do you what, what 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 is your personal take on on those um, the way the films were the you know, the types of stories they were telling then, and how things have evolved to um, the Nigerian movies today. Uh, thank you, Shaka, for for the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, uh, 
first of all, I will say that uh, there is not much difference in 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 the in the type of stories that you know they were telling then, and what we're pretty much doing now. Um, especially the Yoruba genre, because even up till now, you have a whole industry, um, uh, which is a sub, I don't know if I should call it subsection of Nollywood, you know, where their focus is just Yoruba language content. And um, majority of the, some of the epic stories that they do are uh, still pretty much set like what we we have in Kadara, you know. Um, and, you know, what informed all this kind of story basically is just the Yoruba literature. You know, a lot of the stories they tell, you know, um, you know, are uh, informed by uh, most of the folklores that we were told um, growing up. Uh, some of them are also um, uh, facts from, uh, let's say, fire divination uh, and uh, stories of the, you know, Risha and the gods, you know, and then of course um, the the monarch and the the royals, you know, stories of the Alafi and and the rest of them, and and we still have this today. Uh, uh, what I think, I think the aspect that I feel that we need to, uh, right now we, 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 we need to like challenge ourselves, you know, is, uh, the production value. I mean, look at Kadara that was shot in 1978. Uh, you can see, you know, a lot of, I mean, very good cinema work and you can see that, um, a lot of attention was paid to details, even in uh, costuming and um, set and all of that. Um, uh, the modern filmmakers now who are doing those kind of stories don't pay that much attention to, you know, what was even done, you know, with Kadara. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, like I said, I think most of the stories, the, the ones that are told now, uh, and the the most of the ones that the likes of Adelov and Hubert Ogundi and the rest of them were doing then were informed by, um, you know, um, from mouth to mouth story and then the Yoruba literature. Um, that that's what I I, I think. Okay. Um, can you talk a bit? I mean, like you said, this film was uh, was shot in the late 70s. Um, mm -hmm. I believe it was released in 1980. At least that was the... Mm -hmm. that was the yeah, it was, it was released in, sorry, it was released in 1980. It was uh, Mijal Minera that was shot in uh, 1978. Yeah. Kadara was shot in 1980 and it was released in 1980. 1980. Yeah. Um, do you remember the first time you saw it? You saw the film yourself. I think I saw it in 1980. I, I, then there was usually nothing like a premiere, like the kind of premieres that we have now. They yeah. have, the premiere for them was, you know, they target festive seasons, you know. So I know that we usually don't stay at home. We're never home during Christmas. We're never home during um, all the Muslims, holidays, Ilea, Itunua, Idil Fitri, Idil Molut, all of those period, Easter, you know, yeah. we're never home because that is the big period for filmmakers. That is when they release their films in theaters, you know, all, all around the country. So I think I first saw it in 1980, you know. Um, uh, yes, yes, I, I saw it in 1980, but of course, as a young boy, I think I was yeah, five plus, you know, at that time. And uh, um, I could remember clearly, uh, you know, the story. And that's why now if I watch it, I can see all the lines, you know, in the film because I've seen it countless times, yeah. you know. 
Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. So, but but it's one of my favorite because of the multi, the multicultural side to it, and even the multilingual. It has the Aosa Fulani beat, and yeah. you know also the Yoruba Yoruba, Yoruba part to it. Yeah. I thought that was I thought that was very interesting. I mean, it's uh, one of the things that ways in which it definitely differs from a lot of the. Um, <clears throat> films of today, certainly the, Euro, the Yoruba language films of today, is the fact that there was all these mu musical sequences. I guess your father was very musical because he, he plays the violin, well, the tra let me say the traditional violin. Traditional violin. The traditional guitar. Traditional guitar, yes. And he sings, you know, it was quite musical. He, so he plays music, flutes. Music. Yes. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's definitely something we don't see so much in a, in a films today, you know, that musical mm -hmm. element. Um, but, okay, okay, but just to take it back to the film a bit, because um, I talked a bit about, because what we are seeing now is effectively a restoration of this movie after, yeah. you know, that was short 40, I mean, literally 40 years ago. Um, and, I, and like I mentioned in the introduction, a lot of the films of that era truly have been lost because they were shot on celluloid, you know, and a lot of those old prints were not properly preserved. Some of them have simply just been, you know, forgotten in, you know, mm. God knows, maybe somebody's attic, somebody's cellar, somebody's uh, backyard or boys' quarters somewhere. You mm -hmm. know, maybe some of these films will turn up. But, but the truth is that in our modern era, um, you know, the, the era, home video, now we're into streaming and all of this, many of these films yeah. are not available to viewers today to watch. Um, yeah. uh, which is one of the reasons why for me it was such a treat to be able to watch this film. Um, mm. So a lot of the films of that era have lost. So please, if you can just walk us through the journey of how did this film that was shot on 35 millimeter, actually wait, I'm assuming it's 35, I don't know, maybe it was six. I think 16. it was shot 30. I know we have 35 prints. We had 35 and 16 prints. I'm not really sure what it was shot on, whether it was 35 or 16, but I know I used to see a 35 and 16 prints. Okay. Okay. So definitely some form of celluloid, you know, 40 years ago. If you can just give us, like, how did you now bring it into, um, how did the shall I say, the rediscovery and then the restoration process. How did, how did, how did that happen? Okay, well, I mean, um, I think after my father passed in 1996, um, mm -hmm. I think we, we traveled home to my hometown at some point where he removed a lot of his things. And um, I remember I was going through some of his documents and I found his letter written to him uh, from coming I mean, back. Fox Laboratory in Slough, in London. And um, uh, of course, then I didn't make much of the letter because um, even if I wanted to do anything, there was no way. Uh, I mean, I couldn't do much. I was even, I was still working in the bank at that time, you know. Okay. Uh, so uh, so I remember sending an email uh, to the back, to Fox Laboratory in 2002. And um, I, I introduced myself, you know, that um, I love Swan and that uh, I saw this letter that I would like to know what the status in because I saw that my father never signed it. So, and uh, the letter, the content of the letter was that um, it was owing books, laboratory, some money, eight or nine thousand pounds. And they proposed to him that. You know, maybe they should sell the film, some I mean, rights of the film to Channel 4 in the UK. And then that way they could get their money back and, you know, maybe remit some amount to him. Um, but uh, the I never really got uh, any positive uh, response from them. And then I had the opportunity of traveling to London that very year. And uh, I made it the point of duty to, to go to Slav to find a lab. And um, also, I have to also say thank you to Mr. Tunekelani because um, uh, TK, of course, is I mean, he's aware of all these things because he, he was part of the crew 
I shot some of my father's film. You know, I came from Yanwura, which was shot in 1985. Um, so, so then I we went to London together. Myself and TK in 2002, and uh, we went to Slough together. And then I met Mr. Box, who was the owner of Box Laboratory. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so. And, you know, he was so delighted to that. Apparently, he was close to my father, you know, during my father's time. And, and then he showed me a lot of you know, documents, you know, uh, he told me they shared correspondence that they shared. And I said, okay, well, I'm here to take the films, you know, out. So what did we need until to take the scene? Because at that time, you know, the technology, you know, they were using was to tell the scene from from film to digital. Right. And at that time, I think they could only do 1K. Now we have 2K, 3K, 4K, and all of those things. But, you know, so then they gave a bill, you know, of what it's going to cost to pay the outstanding, then to tell it in to digital, and then make master in digital. Mm-hmm. And this well, became, I mean, it was, a huge amount of money in pounds. And then um, I got back home, presented it to the family. And of course, there was no one who could raise the money. But I kept in touch, I kept in touch with the, uh, the lab. And at some point, they sold Box Laboratory to okay. City Lab. Okay. And then um, there's a girl, Dukwe Modukwe, she's based in London. And she's someone who is also very interested in this African film restoration. And, uh, you know, I, she was also, she's been in touch with Box. And then I decided to make her my contact and, you know, like agent in UK. So whenever I'm not there, she's the one that will go to Box and then, you know, go talk to them and see what we can get out. Uh, so not until 2016, is it 2000 and, sorry, 2016 or no, no, no. I think it was 2015 or 14. Wow. I was able to, I mean, I, I wrote to the Lagos State government then, and uh, thanks to the former governor, Baba Tunde Raj Fashola, who then, um, you know, gave us, agreed to like fund the restoration. Wow. Then we were only able to restore three of the films, Kadara, Taxi Driver Part 1, and Taxi Driver Part 2. Uh, uh, and then there, there's three outstanding, and that's um, Yanwura, Golden Mother, um, um, Ichao Rogun, The Rivers, and then um, Ichao Minera, Fight for Freedom. Um, but I kept in touch with the lab. And um, recently, last year, I was able to, to get out Ija Minera, which was my father's first film, you know, as an independent filmmaker. And that was shot in 1978. It was directed by Logo, but produced by, you know, Adi Love and, you know, and all of that. Um, so now we have two films left, and that is Ijao Rogun, The Rivers, and the, and the Yan Ura, um, and, uh, you know, uh, Golden Mother. Now, the, one of the reasons I'm really, I really would love to have these two films is because in those films, my father played twins in the two films. So, you know, and you can imagine that the technology then, you know, where, you know, we have one actor playing, you know, twins, you know, and um, it's, I don't know how come it's the two films where he played twins that we, uh, because Box, I mean, the lab is saying they, 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 some of the reels are missing. So, uh, so I'm hoping that they find them, but uh, regardless, I have decided that I'm still going to get the prints. I'm just hoping that we're able to get money. Uh, so that we can remove, and, and the ones that we've removed, yes, I have the digital version in Nigeria, but I still store 
the the raw in in the storage in UK. Yeah. So we can always still refer to you know the prints and um, even the, the the raw film and sounds and everything. You know, I have them all um, stored in in the UK. So that's that's how we got to. Well, wow, so fant- uh, it's really amazing, uh, and uh, it's a, it's a, obviously it has been a long journey <laughs> to get to this point. You know, um, is there any are there any plans to um, at least the exist the, the films you do have that you have been able to restore, um, Kadara and uh, Taxi Drivers One and Two? Um, are there is it, are there any plans to to distribute them or to maybe um, exhibit them theatrically or maybe put them on some streaming platforms or something? Yeah, well, we had my father's uh, remembrance, I think 20 years of remembrance some time ago, and uh, we screened in few years. Um, you know, but of course, it wasn't because. These new cinemas won't show the film because they just felt, look, it's not going to make money. Uh, you know, so we had to do the traditional style by booking halls ourselves yeah. and then showing the film, you know, just so that we can use that to honor, you know, our father. But I'm trying to talk to streaming platforms, you know, uh, I mean, to see if they are interested in classic films. Uh, from from here and uh, because it would be nice to really have it on you know a, 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 a proper um, streaming platform you know to show the journey and where we're coming from you know and all of that so I'm hoping that will happen because uh, I think I want to I think Netflix at some point should be open to that so, yeah. um, one of the things. I saw, I thought watching the film was um, it really it, I really got the impression that your father was having a lot of fun doing the movie, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I mean, and obviously, I mean, yes, in terms of performance, you know, he really, you know, he just looked like he was really into it. But even beyond that, I'm just you know trying to imagine him at that time directing this, you know, coming up with all these scenarios and everything. You know, it's it's you know, it's it really has that sense of you know, like someone is just really having a good time, just making all this up, and okay, let's just do this, let's do this, let's do this. you know, um, you can, the, the the creativity of it really comes through. Um, do you? Um, I mean, obviously, it's a long time, but did you get the sense that, and and um, obviously, by the time he passed, the industry was shifting. You know, the celluloid era had um, had pretty much died at that point. And you know the Nollywood era was just beginning. What what what, what do you think? What his views of the way cinema was was evolving in Nigeria? Do you think he was fulfilled with the films he had made? And what do you think he thought of you know this video thing that was now emerging at that time? Uh, no, I think he died. Uh, I'm not sure he died a happy man um, because. Uh, at some point, you know, in Nigeria, um, all of them in that space, you know, couldn't afford to make films anymore. They couldn't make films on cellulite, and they didn't want to join the video era. So, and um, he was Ogundi was the first, the first president of uh, the. Um, Association of Nigerian Theatre Practitioners, ANTP. Yeah. And after him was my father. And I remember then they always, Ogunde insisted that he never, he would never do video, you know. Um, and then he would cost out people who were doing video because they believe that he was either celluloid or nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, Inflation came, uh, foreign exchange became, you know, un- unbearable for them. Uh, so they couldn't buy stock because at that time you could only, 
if you film here, you can only print, you know, I mean, in London. And, and I remember in, sometime in the early, I think 92 or there about, Nigeria Film Corporation set up a lab in Just. And that was the very time that Celluloid died. You know, so I'm not sure if any film was ever processed in that lab, you know. Um, but um, I know my father, um, you know, business was tough because this guy really didn't have any other thing to him. It was just film. And unlike, um, you know, West, Western world where uh, royalties and, uh, you know, and copyright and all of that, you know, you know, was properly set up and they can, even if you die, or even if you stop working, you'll be hanging from things you've done. In Nigeria, we didn't have any of those kind of structures, you know, so they make film, they hang, they spend. And then, you know, and I saw a lot of letters that, uh, because he, he, I mean, he, he pretty much used the same model I'm using now, which is, you know, running to banks to get loan to make films. Yeah. And I saw a lot of letters from First Bank and some other banks, and I'm talking as far back as 70s, you know, where he, he was taking loan to make his films. You know, so, um, so at some point he didn't, uh, um, they, they, I mean, the old thing shut down, especially when video came and, um, I know he wasn't happy. He wasn't, he wasn't, he was, he's always complaining until he passed. Oh dear. Oh dear. Mm-hmm. What do you think, um. Speaking about like that aspect of the of, Niger- of the Nigerian film industry, like how do you? Um, I mean, you alluded to it that you you're also kind of in a situation where you know you have to take these loans, you have to do these things. I mean, what do you do? You see a more um, optimistic future in terms of, I guess, the sustainability of uh, the Nigerian film industry. The economics of stuff. Yeah, I, I do. It's changing now. I mean, it's 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 not that it's even changing. It's changed. Uh, now that you have okay, platform like Netflix coming in to commission films, and um, you know, they, I mean, I mean, the commission they'll give you money to make the film, and then you guys agree on rights: who owns what, for how long. So if you're smart, you know, you get the money, make the film. They explore their rights for you know the period that, and then you know it comes back to you, and um, you own it in public, really. and then you just have to find a way to ensure that the film is well secured, you know, so that I mean forever you're going to be hanging as long as the film is good, you know. So that's some that's really relieving because um, um, since I started making film, on, I don't think I'm ever, even up until Mokali that I did two years ago, if I have always used loan to make those films, wow. you know, so, but now it seemed like the better days are here, you know, um, with, with this new, with these platforms coming in. Okay. Um, what, uh, What would you say about, uh, what would you say to, well, no, don't let me pose this in there. I guess I'm trying to, um, one of the things that you and I kind of talked about in an earlier conversation was the fact that today, there are lots of young people, you know, including many young filmmakers who don't even know that there was anything before, you know, what we call Nollywood, before the, you know, the home video, revolution of the 1990s and onwards you know people who don't even know that there you know there are these films that existed before mm. before then you know what what do you think now let me put it like two ways like what do you think um would you, film, um filmmakers of today artists of today um would have to l- um learn from 
those um, the work of that first that pioneer generation. Um, and uh, are there any? And what links can you can you maybe make between the work that was done then and and the work that we are trying to do now that filmmakers today are trying to do in Nigeria now? So during the NSAS protesting, I released some clips from Taxi Driver Part Two, my father's film. And um, it went viral, you know, everybody was circulating it. And uh, they were not only circulating it because, because I read a lot of comments, not only because it's, it's directly, you know, relate to this, the current situation on ground, you know, about police, you know, corruption in police system and all of that, but also because the the film looks clearer than what they see now and people were asking how come a film shot as far back as 1987 you know um is clearer than you know most of the things things that they see now and um and and i always say to people that look if you see and this is not like out of ego or anything but if you watch october 1 uh, 20 years from now, that is how it's going to feel because um, if you put the right production value, if you consider the right production value, um, you know, I mean, story is one thing, but um, um, how you document the story, you know, is another thing. Um, um, I mean, we've seen uh, uh, Sam Bennett's films, a lot of French films that were shot, you know, back then. If you look at them now and you look at the texture and you look at all of that, you know, they look great. Um, yes, technology, the new technology makes it easier, but I think it also has its, um, you know, side effects because it makes people lazy and uh, people always look for shortcuts, you know, mm -hmm. to achieving things. Um, um, you know, I mean, if you, um, like uh, several times uh, we'll put, uh, uh, like, uh, a notice out that we're looking for post-production, you know, like editor or colorist, um, and a lot of people will apply claiming that they are colorist or editor. And then I'll have, you know, we'll interview and I'll have them. I say, show me what you've done. And by the time I look at it. I'm like, okay, look, applying presets does not make you a colorist. Right. You can put preset or just paint or make it colorful and all of that. It still does not mean it is right, you know? And that is what I see. And that is why up till now, I don't grade my film here. I think that's the only thing I always had to do outside of Nigeria. Um, and the next thing for me is with capacity building. And this is what I think really, um, I mean, is key, critical. Um, and another reason why I'm saying that is because look okay, at now we're in pre-production about to start another film. And um, it seemed like everybody's shooting because I mean, COVID took over and now everybody's ready. So everybody's shooting at the same time. Right. Now, the, about the same time when we want to shoot, there are two other productions going on. And you won't believe that it's a shame because we're all recycling the same crew. Wow. So, so you're looking for a sound man and you can only point maybe three, four people. And you're looking for the right gaffer and they're saying he's on that set. And you're saying, okay, am I going to have to wait in an industry of 200 million people, and we always claim that, okay, we're second largest film production. So it means that there's something missing. Yeah. It means that all the energies you see on social media from the young people who always claim that they are creatives and all of that, it means they're not channeling, ch channeling that energy you know, totally in the right direction. It means they need for, for reorientation and there's need for proper training. You know, if not, 
it's going to be, you know, mediocrity and uh, people will just be still doing, I mean, colorful, substandard films, you know, and these films will only appeal to, you know, maybe people here and, you know, it's, it's not going to cross border. Um, do you think, I mean, obviously, the, like, um, if I can just talk about that, like, obviously, the digital technology we're using now, as you said, it's made thing, a lot of things easier, and it's probably made certain things more um, achievable um, mm -hmm. for film industry like Niger the Nigerian film industry, which mm -hmm. definitely doesn't have the economic resources, you know, of, you know, the, like Hollywood or you know, big some of the big European uh, um, film industries, uh, for instance. Um, but do you think uh, we should be? Hmm, how should I put this? Do you think the, the emphasis should be more to a young filmmaker? Do you think the emphasis should be more on mastering the technical side of it, or saying focus on you know the substance of your of your narrative? Um, or are the two aspects simply inseparable and they just have to try and make everything, you know? No, and I think they are inseparable because look, if you have great stories mm -hmm. and um, your story is amazing, but it's badly shot, um, it limits the number of platforms, distribution platforms that you can get to. As a matter of fact, if you give it to the core people who decide fate of films when it comes to um, getting it, you know, uh, distributed, once they see five minutes of your film and uh, your sound is up and down, um, you know, your, your, your filming and angles are wrong, uh, you know, and all of that, they will drop it, you know, I mean, they won't even have the patience to see how great the, the picture, I mean, the story is, right? right? So, but um, if you have a great, if it is cinematically shot and, um, you know, it looks great, um, they, sometimes they get carried away first, you know, because, oh, they think it looks great. So it, they want to spend more time to watch until they realize it's a shitty story, if it is a shitty story, right. you know. So, so it's important to always strike a balance. You know, don't be too deep into, oh, look, if I don't achieve this shot this way, I'm not going to rest, you know. Um, no, no, no. Story is, is, is so important, you know. Uh, but standard um, quality picture, um, yeah. I mean, sorry, picture quality, and um, I mean, decent sound, audio, um, you know, I think is all you need to actually make this magic. Okay, fantastic. Um, if I can stay in, in a slightly different direction, I want to talk a little bit about, um, um, I guess the, the, maybe the, um, the social content of, um, of your father's film. Um, one of the things I, that struck me um, watching Kadara was that there was, it was very what we today would call inclusive. You know, you have uh, prominent fem feminine char uh, female characters, for, uh, women who are very strong, very you know strong characters, <laughs> both strong physically, as in you know there are some really interesting fight scenes uh, with some of the characters, but also you know but also just strong you know in, in personality, you know strong willed, opinionated. You know, there's never any sense oh women are second class. No, women mm. are kind of placed in a very prominent position. And I thought that was very progressive. Um, considering some of the things we see in some, you know, some of the other, um, some other um, films and stories that have come out of Nigeria, but also mm. some of the, you know, cultural mores and ideas that tend to be promoted, you know. But, you know, you've got very strong female characters. You've also got this multi-ethnic thing. You talked about the fact that, you know, um, um, some of the prominent characters were Hausa Fulani within mm. this uh, Yoruba, milieu and they speak their language and their culture is never portrayed as second uh, second mm. class or second rate or you know in any way it's you know they're you know they're all equals and then you've got the um 
the 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 um, the character of uh, your father's um, well, your, the, the character played by your father, his best friend in the film, is a dwarf, and um, yeah. it's and you know it's it's referred to, it's definitely pointed out, but it's not you know pointed out in a way yeah, that not in a, as an object of mockery or yeah. anything. It's just another guy, you know. He too fights. He too makes jokes. He too does every, you know. It's just a, it's just another guy. And so that's another thing that really struck me. That you know, this film, you know, it's forty years ago, but it was very inclusive, very open-minded. You know, you know, kind of very egalitarian in the way it treated mm. all different characters, different regardless of you know where they're coming from or their, you know, their station. So, you know, what, what, uh, was that some, do, do you think that was something that was conscious, that your father was consciously trying to do? Or was, just, or was it just part of who he was that, you know, he didn't really kind of see the difference or see any, you know? Um, honestly, I really can't speak for him. Uh, but I think one of the, I mean, in, 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 in regards to that aspect, but I feel that, there's a bit of um, northern influence, you know. You know, uh, uh, I mean, because we're from Quara, and uh, you know, up to today, some people always think that uh, the people from Quara are Fulani. You know, meanwhile, we are from the typical the colors Igbomino, and we're from the typical Yoruba part of Quara State. You know, where we're from or or your or your proper. And if you look at my father's face, he had tribal marks, you know, and those are like core Yoruba form of identity, you know. Um, uh, but um, because he also, I think he was also a market, marketing gimmick. Um, because at that time, nothing was happening in the East. There were no cinemas in the East. They don't go to cinemas, but the North and and the West, you know, were the people who were doing and going to cinemas, and um, there were large population of Yorubas in the North, you know, even up till now, you know. So, and I know that at that time, when a film is done. You know, they, they travel to, I mean, Sokoto, Kadanaka, Nojeba, all of these places to show those films. Right. Uh, so, so I think it was also because he wanted those people to feel, have a sense of belonging, you know, so that the people watching are not only the Yorubas in the North. Right. So the Northerners, they watch a lot of um, Indian films. And then if you watch, if you look at my dad's style, um, some of his songs, he, they are usually, you know, he converts uh, Indian tune, you know, and then use okay. Yoruba lyrics. Oh. Yes. <laughs> you know, so, so, so I've analyzed all of these things and I figure that, look, this man is just being smart, you know, he wants a larger, audience you know and uh, you know like the people to appreciate and he just wanted to cut across you know i mean he wanted to appeal to more people not just the yorubas but you know even people in that in that side you know so so yeah so i think uh and he, he speaks it i know he speaks a bit of Aosa, but i think this is just from the fact that they all travel even my mother <laughs> They travel far and wide, you know, they tour these films, you know, and sometimes they will go for two months and they won't come back because they'll be going from one, you know, uh, one another. city to a town to another. Yeah. And I was going to say, okay, um, just to talk a little bit about your own work as well. Um, well, okay, well, I'll ask you, I guess, the obvious question, which is, uh, are, are there any influences from your father's work in yours? You know, whether it's a direct, whether it's direct, directly in terms of maybe aesthetics or whether it's maybe in the manner he worked or some, you know, if there are any aspects, you know, so I guess that's the obvious question I, 
I'll, I'll mm. probably start off from. But mm-hmm. beyond that, um, I guess uh, I, I was, I'm also curious to know what, uh, you know, what your plans are in terms of, um, well, specifically in terms of the kind of films that you want to, you, you know, you want to make, um, because you, I know you've made so many films. You, you know, you've made period dramas, you've made uh, kind of a, a thriller slash horror with the figurine, you've made a romantic comedy, <laughs> you know, you've done a lot of, you know, coming of age, mm. you know, you've done a lot of, you really kind of, yeah, crossed a lot of terrain. So I was just curious to know what, what uh, directions you're interested in exploring next. Okay, I, in regards to my father, I think, um, I mean, he wasn't around when I started. I mean, and then he, even when he was around, he, he didn't encourage that we go into the same thing. He He's always discouraging it because he's always saying there's no money in it, that, um, you know, that we should go to school and become a doctor because he said, you know, this that there's no money in film. Um, but at that time, I think I was, when I was privileged to be on some of the sets, I didn't, I never thought I was gonna end up being, you know, a, a filmmaker. Um, uh, not until, <clears throat> not until after my father passed and then, it was Nollywood, and I started seeing some sort of decay, and that's what I call it, because I then started comparing what my father and the likes were doing. I was comparing it to what people were doing then in the nineties, and I'm like, no, this, you know, I've been on my father's sets before, where they spent almost two months filming, and then. You know, in the early 90s, people would shoot a whole film in three days. And I'm like, ah, well, I mean, how, what's, what's going on? And then when you, of course, when you look at the output, you can you see that huge difference, you know, in the whole thing. So, so I started saying, I think I can make better film. You know, I mean, you know, I, at least I can be in between the, my father's era and then this new era. You know, um, and then I would look at the stories, I would look at the acting, and I'm like, no, how come? I mean, the actors then were more passionate, you know, they were so passionate, you know, and then production value was huge. So, I mean, I honestly, that was why I, I said to myself, that, look, I think I can do this thing better, you know, and then, um, and then I went to TK. You know, it was the first person I went to in, uh, I think, 1997. My father died in 1996. So I went to TK in 1997. I said, sir, I'd like to make film. And he said, who are you to make film that, that your father was a filmmaker does not make you a filmmaker? He said, you don't inherit filmmaking. You learn it. <laughs> you know, he said you can, he said, but acting, of course, you can do acting and all of that because you have good face for it. But film, you have to study. It. I said, okay, sir. You know, I said, but you can start as a as an actor. Um, if we have anything, we'll let you know. And then in 2008, I'm sorry, in 19, 1998, okay. when they wanted to do shower right there, they now ask that I come for audition. And I went, and then I was picked, you know, for that role. And uh, so I will clearly say that TK was, I mean, a, a, a major integral part, you know, of why and how I got to where I am today. Because I think it was through him that I actually learned, you know, how to be passionate you know, uh, you know, about film, you know, um, uh, because I got close to him that I was seeing him like every weekend, even though I was working in the bank at that time, but even if he calls me, even whilst in the bank, and he's like, oh, they're doing something in the Badon Film Festival, I'll leave the bank and I'll take an excuse and I'll run. 
you know, and I'll go with him. So, and every second that we spend together, all we talk about is film. Mm. You know, you can't really teach people how to direct. You can't say this is how to direct. So TK never really, I don't think there was any time he ever said to me, this is how to direct. But from the conversation, I picked what I want to pick. You know, sometimes I'll invite him to my house and then I'll cook and we'll just watch film from morning to night. We can watch three films, Indian films, American films, you know, so these were things that I was doing with him, you know, and then I will see him on, uh, you know, front cover of film, International Film Festival uh, program. And yeah. I'm like, how come this man is the only one that goes to festival? You know, especially after the likes of my father, because I know my father went to a lot of festivals. But after my father's era, it was TK. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I want, I want to go to festivals, you know? And then I'll ask him question and he said, so, so that was it. And then I worked in the bank in 2004. I just said, look, okay, I'm not doing this bank thing again. And then I, I went to film school, you know, just to brush up my idea and understanding of film, came back and the rest is history today. Fantastic. Mm. So, um, so as to the, your next move in terms of, you know, where, you know, because like I said, you've tried it, you've done a lot of things, not just tried, you've done a lot, you've done a lot of genres, a lot of moods. Mm -hmm. What, what are the things that you still want to explore cinematically? No, I'm still just going to be doing different genres. I'm already in pre-production. I mean, I'm done with citation. I'm shooting another film in January, which is an adaptation of a book. And, um, and um, I have like four, feel, four scripts locked to be shot between now and the next four years. So if I'm alive, I'm just going to be having fun shooting films and, you know, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we're looking forward to seeing the films. And um, the work still to be shot, and um, and looking forward. I'm personally looking forward to seeing more of your father's films. I hope we, you know, we have a chance. Uh, maybe in a future festival, we'll get you know a chance to see Taxi Driver one and two, and um, you know, keep our fingers crossed that you know you're able to restore the other outstanding films. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing all that too. So, no, those yeah. are some of the things you know. We have uh, like a studio now. Um, is is like a mini cultural center. Uh, yeah. So within the hub, we're going to have a one twenty seater cinema, and wow. um, we're also going to have like a small sound stage, a bar, restaurant. So we're going to be curating films. We're going to be doing movie nights. You know. Uh, oh. Then you know, live band night, you know, on the mainland, you know. So these are, so we'll be watching classic films, you know, uh, you know, whichever. It doesn't have to be just my father's. Any film that you know has been restored, you know, we'll bring it. So there will be a lot, you know, of such an opportunity to also see those films. Fantastic, fantastic. Mm -hmm. well, we're looking forward to it. Well, thank, thank you, you so much, Eric. Thank you, Shaker. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs>